How is everybody? I'm good. I'm a little frazzled. I just, uh, I witnessed a robbery. Oh, no. Yeah. Just today? Hey, Marco. Hey. I was, uh, I'm a little rattled because I just, uh, just got back from the precinct. I had to be interviewed. I, I witnessed a robbery in the apartment building across from mine. Because mm -hmm. wow. I'm on a rear, a rear window. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I have a courtyard and there's an apartment building across. It. And I saw uh, someone breaking into an apartment. So I called 911. And um, they called me back and said, would you meet us downstairs? We can't find the apartment. And I didn't know what the apartment number was. It just It's the building across from me. <laughs> So it was really crazy. Wow. So I went over there and they finally found the guy and he met my description. And then I had to go down to the precinct and be interviewed three or four times by different people. I guess they got to get the report accurate. Anyway, I feel like I've been in a Hitchcock movie. <laughs> I, was, I was wondering, John. Uh, it's right. It's, it's right. Window? Right I feel like Jimmy Stewart. Remember Jimmy Stewart in that movie, Rear Window, where he's seeing a crime. He suspects a crime is happening. You know, it was just it's like. Not many the, broken bones, though, do you, John? <laughs> just, this is just a robbery, or who knows what it was. But wow. Anyway, that's uh, that's my. Uh, it's very much an altered state, though. I start to learn about my memory and mm -hmm. how the memory starts to play tricks on you. And you, they say, and they ask me. They read back my original. They wanted me to describe it again and again and again. And I realized each time I described it, I wanted to elaborate. Yeah. <laughs> I would add things in, <laughs> make it more interesting. I realized this is, must be a, the, the legal profession's biggest nightmare is, you know, people describe something. And then um, a year later, when they're in the courtroom, they describe something totally different. And that's the nature of memory. Memory's mm -hmm. not like a snapshot of an actual event. It's a recreation. So I was very sensitive to that. that mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, that, I hope this is a lead into our discussion today. <laughs> I think we are dealing with our, our memory and uh, the different memories and how memory is distributed among groups of people and how we punctuate that and develop that, that capacity in ourselves. So I'm looking forward to whatever happens next. <laughs> Excellent. Welcome, everyone. Um, I would like to kick it over to Marco to give some context. So this is my first Cosmos Cafe. I have been missing out on all of the great conversations happening on Tuesdays. So I just want to understand a little bit more about how these typically go. And um, I have suggestion for kind of a catalyzing couple of questions and then just let it let it go from there. But uh, also okay. open to others' thoughts on what they'd like to get out of this this conversation too. Well, I I, I think that you know for the sake of context, um, you know we we've all been talking with each other for a series of weeks. I think this is our sixth or seventh uh, call, uh, and uh, we're not all on every call. Uh, Doug has come in now, etc. <laughs> depending on who's, who's available, and it's open. Uh, you know, it's an open space for others to, to join in, uh, including in the forum where oftentimes the discussions you know, continue and elaborate upon themes that arise in, in, the, in the talks and vice versa. So they, they kind of flow back and forth. But uh, we've been taking turns uh, proposing topics and doing a, a little presentation on them perhaps or a longer presentation, you know, depending on the subject matter, and then opening up a discussion to see what see what happens uh now in the case of cosmos insofar as we have a goal or an objective or some sense of collectively wanting something to have happen then that kind of open-endedness could um perhaps you know, tend toward a more concrete direction or, or sense of manifestation but that really can't come from myself alone or from you alone and i think part of the point of doing a cafe like this is that we could really bring the discourse into an op a more open space that allows it to percolate and do different things and, um, 
and uh, move into the next phase, whatever that may be. Uh, we certainly have ideas about it, but uh, I think the important thing is to bring it into this uh, phase space and the shared space. Cool. Okay. Um, so I have was introduced to clean language questions by John Davis. Um, and I really, I really like them and I've been kind of exploring them more, but especially I really like the almost the initiating question of clean language questions, which is what would you like to have happen? I love that because it's so open-ended and yet aspirational. And I, I think it's a great orienting question to be asking ourselves in um, a variety of contexts. And in this case, it's the, the, that question can be posed to us as users of this proto platform, cosmos.coop and its different features and functions. And what would we like to have happen um, of this community, of this platform, uh, yeah, of our, of our experience of it. Um, so that's kind of where I, I'd love to just orient from is um, so kind of an open-ended uh, exploration of what would we like to have happen. And I want to also bring in um, John's suggestion from the, the, the forum thread of using feedback questions specifically structured as what I like, what I don't like, and what I want more of, because that could maybe give it a little bit more structure as well. What do folks think about that? <laughs> well, I think those are great questions. <laughs> you would, John. <laughs> I'll, I'll just jump in and, um, uh, you know, try not to. I think my challenge is in uh, the difference between feedback and criticism. Um, criticism, I believe, comes out of a very positive intention to evaluate someone else's work in a way that's helpful. Um, and that's when it's constructive. Uh, but the timing has to be right for that. Uh, and I don't think that many of our efforts here really need a critic yet. Um, I do think we need feedback. And that's why I said what I like, what I don't like, what I want more of. That's not criticism, really. That's just a very first-person response. And, uh, you know, I think that critic can step back, be cool and detached, and look at different um, systems and how they work together and think about the history and, and what needs to, and what's missing in this particular instance. So that's my logic here. So I'm just saying as a user, um, what I like and... Um, and there's a, quite a bit that I like, and that's why I keep returning. I think the, um, I think I like these open, uh, these kinds of conversations like we're having right now, these kind of video conferences. Sometimes they're like a seminar, a lecture. Uh, sometimes it's just an open-ended, open frame. I think the, the, the balance between structure and openness and process is very important for me personally. If it just seems like everyone just having a lively, uh, you know, chat fest, I have my, my attention span is not that great for that kind of thing. Uh, I have more than enough information in my life, <clears throat> so I, I don't need more. I, what I do need is a kind of a, a performance space, if you will, where people can elaborate on their doubts their worries, their aspirations, and um, bring them, bring uh, what's probably implied, implicit, make it explicit, so that we can explore our agendas together. I mean, we all have them. Sometimes they're just not fully, fully formed or articulated adequately, because they were so uh, afraid of getting shot down by a critic. <clears throat> and I think that's where uh, the challenge is. And I think it's I applaud Caroline for asking for criticism and or feedback because um, she said she's eager for critique, and I think that's great. Um, and I just want to, anyone who here feels they're adequate to critique, I say go for it. But I personally don't feel like I'm ready to critique others um, because I don't think we've really clearly differentiated the, 
the, the dreamer, the realist, the critic, these functions are extremely important in any healthy thriving organization, but you don't want them bumping into each other. So if there's a dreamer tentatively and shyly articulating her vision, you don't want to come in there and say, tell her what's missing. <laughs> you, want to let, you want to let her expand and use her imagination. And then you get the data, the, the, the realist will collect the data and the short-term and the long-term um, negotiations that need to be implemented to make this vision happen. And then you get the critic who can evaluate it all. And then we can circulate um, uh, any feedback that gets amplified throughout that system. So this is my where I'm coming from. And I think there's a lot of commonality probably in, in our different orientations because all of us have worked in organizations or, or been facilitators. And um, there are lots of theories out there on how best to you know create generative conversations and collaborative collaborations. And uh, I just applaud Marco and Caroline and Ed and Douglas and all the regulars here. And I just uh, hope we can uh, open, our, open our hearts and minds to the people out front, because there may be people who are observing this from a distance. And there may be people like Jamie, who recently saw one of our hangouts, I think, on, on Globes and decided to join us. So uh, those, are, those, I believe, are good signs. Thank you. That's Thank you, John. Um, Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Doug. Uh, I'll throw up my introduction here. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so it sounds like what you're saying, John, is that it would be sticking with, we want to kind of focus on the first question, what I like about anything that goes on this website um, with other people that are involved with it. Like we want to continually promote ourselves, others, and anyone that comes about here to to just get out what they like, what they're about. Um, for example, uh, Zach Fetter, I, um, he just quickly posted on there saying, I don't have much time to be here. Um, and this goes in with what I can contribute. But So I go in, examine his website, and rather than saying, oh, nice article um, that he made, or long essay, um, I'm just posting a comment there, I, I kind of I, I see us here connecting various threads, various websites, whether personal blogs or um, some like-minded um, cosmos collectives that are developing on the side as we need to branch out and see these people and speak to these people and allow them to see what's going on here. I'll stop there. I have a lot more to say. But I've lost my my notes. <laughs> if I could just <laughs> reflect back on that, uh, what you described, when I see it in my mind, it looks like a kind of neurological process or like a synaptic process. It looks like you know a brain integrating. Now, that's just a vision. That's just a metaphor. But to reflect back on on that notion, that uh, insofar as this is a particular gravitational center in a larger media sphere, uh, you know, that um, there could be, you know, interconnections between their constellations amongst uh, different centers and the way that people move between them because we're part of a larger thing. Uh, and so what you're describing is, I think, um, an integration process where there's like synaptic connections uh, that we make as individuals, as uh, organization, as whatever, however we really parse the, you know, the nomenclature, the identity, you know, of what it is, it's really part of a larger unfolding, part of a larger uh, mystery. Uh, and that's what's exciting to me about the, the sort of metaphorical aspects is that we can point at that kind of a thing. We can have different kind of kinds of conversations because we can create different kinds of metaphorical space. And so I appreciate um, you uh, being here <laughs> and doing that um, because it's so wonderful to see it just happening. Uh, you know, kind of like in my, you know, in what I envision as a dreamer, uh, you instantiate it as a person. So that, that's, that's meant to be gr grateful, but it's also meant to just, you know, point to um, a, a reality and a behavior and uh, a possibility that you articulate. Yeah. And that's, I guess, one of my greatest 
potential gifts I can give to anybody, at, not necessarily just this website. Um, clerking, for example, I, I just started at, with the, the Quakers last year. I don't necessarily know if I believe in Quakerism, the, the history of its Christian influence uh, and all that, but I, I really love the group of people that are there, and they obviously love me, or they wouldn't have had some new fella become clerk of the co-clerk of the entire meeting and I'm in charge of the financial committee. I'm in charge of at least integrating all these things. And I'm, I, I have no experience. I, I have, other than I have a family, <laughs> I, I have no experience of teaching or bringing together the whole or speaking with various different groups. So this is going to be a great learning process for me with, with that Quaker, Quaker group along with tying that in with here, I, I see myself as filling in that role in some sort of sense. Um, maybe maybe uh, Marco protege, if you want to do that. I, I don't want to fill in for your role here, but as you mentioned, it's it's quite a bit of stuff you're trying to take care of, you and Caroline, and I, I don't know what I have to offer or how much time I can give you all, but I know that I'm going to be here for the long run whether you like it or not and if i overstep my bounds <laughs> if i overstep my bounds please let me know as i've mentioned in a few um, emails to you all um, but at the same time just just let me do what i'm i'm doing and give me pointers along the way and um, that's that's what i can offer and yeah tying that in with what we were talking about just bringing in other people it's it it, it has the potential here to to sort of explode at some point. Um, I, I, I see that. We, we see the same faces here on the cafes and whatnot, but there are a few that will pick up along the way. I, I started in November um, just participating mm -hmm. on the conversations, and now I want to have other people do that as well. And My ideas are definitely not great, <laughs> so I, I'd like to see people that have better ideas than I do. Flourish. I want to help others, just as you all propose here. I want to help others see their vision, because I don't really have one. <laughs> I would love to respond to that. Thank you so much, Doug, for sharing. Is it okay if I call you Doug or Douglas? Any anything you want to call me. Okay. <laughs> call me anything you want. Just don't call me late for dinner. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would love to respond to that. Um, I think there are. There's oftentimes um, I notice that there's a, a certain pattern that maybe is missing, like from our lives, and it it applies on all scales, like a fractal, like what the thing is. If we had it and it, it actually crossed these different scales, um, we would be more fulfilled. And one of those, like what what this brings up to me is um, the question of how we can facilitate each other in a kind of relational structure. Um, or a relational normative flow of, of resources whereby we're facilitating each other to fulfill on the question of what would you like to have happen for yourself um, as an artist or as a, you know, as a, as a whole being in the world. Um, one example of how this has looked for me, and this is something I would say is something I want more of, um, how this has looked for me with respect to my involvement in Cosmos is that you know i have i have blossomed and challenged myself and done things as a writer that i would not have done if it weren't for the kind of incubational <laughs> um relationship with marco as a collaborator and the kinds of appropriate pressures that he applied at different points for you know that that pushed me to new new attainments um, that wouldn't have otherwise happened. And so in terms of realizing one's creative potential or, you know, realizing or, or not realizing, but um, attaining fulfillment of what one would like to have happen and defining it in terms of artistic achievement, um, that is something that's already happening. And I know I'm not the only one who has benefited from that kind of a pattern. Um, and I would love to explore how we could distribute that pattern among each other as a kind of a cultural norm so that that is just spontaneously and creatively arising in terms of how we interact with each other. Um, so that's something that 
I'd like to see more of is exploring um, how we can be facilitators for each other and not just on individual aspirations, but also small group collaboratives or, um, you know, like collective uh, initiatives such as posing certain philosophical questions or, or reading a book together or whatever, like how we can kind of each of us gain the proficiency and the skill and the practice of doing that for each other as kind of a cultural pattern. Ed, did you want to speak? No, no, go right ahead. Go right ahead. Um, I just, uh, well, I, I, I believe we have a track record already. So we, we have as a group, we can look backwards now and we can look forwards. Uh, and I think Caroline's series, The Trumpocalypse, was an, uh, a dynamic reference point for all of us. Um, she developed material and wrote some essays and got a chance to read her work before we got together. And um, it was a catalyst for each of us expressed ourselves the way we wanted to, but there was uh, something that we could all point to and share as a shared dynamic reference point, I call them. And I, as, and I believe that that was one, and I think there have been others. And I just hope, and I try as best I can in the, in the written form, if I, because what I do is if I participate online in a conversation and it gets posted on YouTube, I uh, watch it and then I take notes and I look for patterns and meta patterns. And then if I see something, I'll write it down in on uh, the thread in a thread, and um, see if any any if I get any feedback, and if I do, then maybe something gets amplified and, and developed. And this is all very unconscious, you know. These un these right beneath the surface, all kinds of things uh, are happening, and I think that for me, that's really a very useful uh, aspect of this adventure because I can, when I'm in a conference, face to face with you guys absorbing your ideas and listening to your voices and your faces and your eyes and hearing these different tones. It's a uh, very in immersive. But then when I s sit back and watch it after the event has occurred, I can put on my critics hat, you know, and say, Oh, look for patterns. And I'll notice things I, I didn't notice in the moment. Actually, after a conference is over, I usually have total amnesia for what happened <laughs> you know, because it was, I was in the moment. <laughs> So I think that's um, something that our technology and how we're using it here is very helpful uh, because I, I, um, I think it gives me a chance to reflect and then participate and then reflect and then to share my reflections and then hear other people's reflections because other people are going to probably be picking up on totally different kinds of patterns than myself. And so that's why I think the, the, the group dynamic we become more self-reflexive about our own participation. And I believe that's extremely important in our very fragmented society that we're moving more towards coherence than decoherence, which is why I show up because I got burned out by Facebook and I was just getting more and more overwhelmed by um, my own shrillness. I heard myself getting very shrill in some of these forums and I didn't like the way I felt afterwards. And um, I found uh, this is sort of like a, a, an oasis of, of peace and calm <laughs> in comparison. And uh, yet, but I don't want it to get too calm mm -hmm. uh, or peaceful. There needs to be enough stimulation, but not too much. So I guess I'm aiming for that Goldilocks zone um, where you're not overwhelmed but you're not underwhelmed either. You're just in that zone where you can participate effectively and make some sense of what's going on uh, rather than just feel more fragmented afterwards. So that's my two cents. Go for it, Ed. Okay. <laughs> What, are you guys going to make me say something? <laughs> I got your tongue? No, Resident, Resident curmudgeon needs to speak up. <laughs> feel, feel free to be, feel free to, to, to be the critic. <laughs> well, here's the whole thing. As long as you don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> That's right. You can call me anything you want. Just don't call me late. Um, 
I, I started out on the internet back in Usenet. I, I think I've mentioned that once before. And that was a place where people could exchange ideas very much like now, except it was all in text. There was no video involved. And every discussion, every, every interchange that, that I experienced devolved into a flame war and eventually ended with Hitler. There's that, there is that law out there. I think it's Godfrey's law that you know, at some point Nazism comes up and Hitler gets it. And then the discussions, are that, you knew the discussions are now over. But everybody flamed through the discussions as far as they could. And the difference to what's, what's going on here is we don't devolve into flame wars. And I, I think one of the reasons is that we, it's like John said, we actually see each other. We see somebody's reaction. When we say something really bizarre, we see eyes open up and jaws drop. And, <laughs> that, and that, that's, that helps. You know, it helps a whole lot to kind of say, oh, okay, well, maybe I went a little too far with that. Because the one thing that struck me, especially what John was saying at the beginning, and, and I'm going to pick up on a thread that Jeffrey mentioned in his post. You know, this is a very English language centric um, forum, which, which it need be. I, I, you know, that's, that is not a criticism. That is merely an observation. But one of the observations that, that, that comes with that is um, English speaking people tend to be um, too polite for their own good. This is something I learned being in Germany, where directness is has a whole different meaning than it does in America. And and you can get you can get hit with a two by four between the eyes, and everybody else just goes, "Well, they're just saying what is. They're not criticizing. <laughs> You're not supposed to take this personally, uh, even though that you personally did that." So, so I think what what what's co op. It's the co-op itself is trying to, and Cosmos is trying to do, is you want to become an attractor. We're trying to, in some way, and I realize there's only a few regular participants in the cafes. They haven't cut on yet. But it's like, it's like Jamie's a, a case in point. Well, he shows up for one. He hears about this. He jumps in. Um, people do come up. Um, Hester is now in the, in the, in the Slaughter Dyke group. She wasn't there before. You know, so so people do come in and they will come in and out, but we're trying to create some kind of critical mass where people realize you can go in here, you can say what you think, you can contribute to a discussion, and nobody's going to jump down your throat because of it. Criticism, I think, is generally accepted by all of us. Yes. You know, we, we, we really don't have, you know, I'm willing to play the role of the curmud, but because I, I am curmudgeon most of the time. You know, I, I do have a bad case of getting old. You know, so, OK, but that's the way things are. And you guys all tolerate it. And, 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 and that's that's good for me. And so I think what's good for me is good for you as well, because it allows you to express that here. You can actually express some criticism without it getting too involved in anything. And and, and the whole it's in the, the process itself. I think what I would like to see happen is that we, we just have more of what we do. Because I actually think what we're doing is a good thing and it's on the right path. Just because there's not people streaming in from all four corners of the earth really doesn't say anything about the value of what's going on here. Because that, that will come of its own accord. And I would be willing to bet now, I'll write this down, put it in a sealed envelope and send it to one of you people. There will come a time when that will flip and you will have far greater problems than you imagine now when you try to handle an onslaught of people who think they understand what's going on, but only understand it from their own view of what's going on. So, and that can also happen because I've seen that in, in real live organizations where people actually do meet from time to time. And it's the, it's the personal interaction form of the flame war. <laughs> and somebody becomes authoritarian and takes on the role of Hitler and it all ends. You know, so so there are certain patterns that, that, that keep reoccurring. And as long as we're sensitive to and aware of and 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 willing to engage, I think that's that's good. And the the if there were one characteristic about all of our talks that we have that I would hold up to be the highest of them all, it is it's the it's the level of humanity that is expressed. 
the allowing of an other to be who he or she is. For whatever reason, for whatever role they might have and might not have from one, from one session to another. And I think that's, that's a very important thing that we allow others to be. And as long as we can keep that in the back of our minds that nobody, even when we say things that might be a little pointed or a little, maybe a little too direct for our others' sensibilities, it's not really intended that way. And it's okay to say, well, you know, well, slow down a little bit. That was, uh, I think I got your point <laughs> before you charge through the door. <laughs> Uh, kind of thing. And we, we do that as well. And I think we need to be able um, to allow ourselves to do that as well. And to simply express who we are and what we are and why. And, and, and you know, follow those, those things that occur to us naturally. You know, we're all, I'm not saying polite to a fault, we're all very polite and we can be polite and we should be polite. But we, we also need to be forceful in what we think and what we do. And I think it's, I think I really love it when I see people um, expressing things with passion, you know, some, um, I'm very often, though, I miss passion, you see. But passion can turn a lot of other people off. Mm. You know, you see a little passion, you go, oh, I don't know, there's a little too much feeling going on in here. And, and so it's okay to have, you know, not too much thinking, and we've got to have feeling. I'm a big fan of the effective components of, of consciousness and mentality and all of those things. I, I truly believe that our feelings tell us what to think. You know, um, not not everybody sees things that way. We we think things, and then we decide how we feel about them. I'm like, yeah, I I don't think so. I think it's the other way. Um, but then again, that's something we can also talk about. Mm-hmm. Something, and that's actually something we do talk about in a lot. Of it. We just don't speak that directly. So it's this this human interaction. It's allowing people to be, and it's allowing to, and accepting others for who they are sets a wonderfully good example because if there's anything missing in my little world where, where I tend to run around, it's precisely that. And that's why I keep coming back because I can be a jerk when I'm a jerk and I can be a good guy when I'm a good guy. And I can be smart sometimes too. And, and people might appreciate it. And, and at the end of the day, I go, okay, well, it wasn't so bad. No injuries, no blood. Good day. No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm reminded of John uh, describing this as a performance space because, in a way, you can show up as a character. Uh, yeah. We all show up as the characters that we're pretending to be to a certain degree, and some yeah. of that, you know, comes from, you know, comes not through conscious deliberation or intentional, you know, craft, but through the way we, ha- you know, through what side of the bed we wake up on uh, <laughs> that morning. Well, and I, I think so much about how our own thought constructs and interior schema of thoughts um, limit how we show up in the world. And so Mm -hmm. in a space where you can explore an aspect or archetypes that are maybe not your dominant mode, but are a part of you integrating yourself, that is, that's huge. Mm -hmm. Um, I really appreciate your reflections, uh, Ed, about, you know, kind of just to summarize maybe what I, what I was hearing, it's like mm-hmm. keeping awareness and understanding of the whole person, the whole self at the center of everything we do in discourse, in designing the platform in, you know, et cetera. It's just keeping that awareness. And that means being tolerant of how people show up each day and mm-hmm. being uh, tolerant of, you know, just of divergence and creativity and not just tolerant, right. But actually encouraging. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So how does that look? Yeah. 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 No. Can I chime in? <laughs> no, I, I don't know, John. We're going to have to. I have, I have a little bell here. <laughs> don't we're have to draw a map, though. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, I just want to be polite because sometimes I charge in when someone may have, they haven't finished their thought. Right. So um, it's, it's for me, the challenge is sort of transferring the benefits of being in real time in a real environment with somebody. And then here we are online and it's, it, it, it's a, it's a challenge for us. I think, uh, I think cause we want to maintain that quality of uh, energy that happens in the same room when you're sharing a real space with someone and what's happening here. So it's been a little, feels a little artificial sometimes because I don't know when someone's finished their sentence yet and I don't want to barge in too fast, but I don't want there to 
And when there are these long pauses, it's not because I don't have something to say or you don't have something to say. We just don't know whose turn it is to talk. Mm -hmm. And that's something if we were in the same room together, we wouldn't have that problem. So I think a lot of that uh, happens to me in the threads as well. If I if I'm eager about something that I think uh, I've discovered about someone else or the group or the idea and I post it and no one responds after two days, I will delete it because I don't want to leave anything at open for too long because my mind gets very cluttered with unfinished business. And that's why I got off Facebook. So I'm just, that's the thing I don't like is when no one responds to a post after it's been there for four or five days. Um, because it's it's either because uh, no communication is a communication. So it's either indifference or they didn't like what I said or whatever. But it's sort of I'm not getting the feedback I need. And it could be just, you know, it could be someone just responding by saying, you know, I don't like this. That's mm -hmm. great. <laughs> That's a response. So I'm just letting you guys know this because. I think we want to attract people, um, high quality uh, people who are looking for a better place than Facebook. We need to see activity here, people responding. Um, pro or con doesn't matter, just a response. And I would, I would and like I've, to respond to that whenever you're finished. Well, with I just want to say, but this last week, I've been very delighted by a, an upsurge in response. Um, not just me, but I'm looking at other people responding to other people's posts beside my own. That I find very stimulating. Thank you. I'm finished. I'm finished. Oh. I'll ring my bell. Dinner <laughs> 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 bells. I concur. It is tricky because sometimes though, I like to take notes in writing to help me digest information I'm hearing uh, on the spot. And when I'm not looking at the screen, Right? I don't know if someone's like ready to stop talking or like what the, you know, so all those cues that you talked about of, whereas if we were in person, it would be easier. Yeah, I, I resonate with that. Um, and I think that I want to, I'd like to uh, kind of steer the conversation into some of this problem areas or, or, you know, kind of struggles that we face in using the platform and tools as they are, um, because I think there is a very real tension between wanting to encourage thoughtfulness and reflection and letting things incubate and letting people, you know, really draw from multiple sources in their composition of a response and really enriching the conversation that way and going deep in a conversation that way. And, um, the timeliness of things, right? I have at least probably 10 infinite conversation forum threads that I've indexed to like, oh, I got to get back to that, including Cosmos Cafe. You know, I, I um, have heard of all the great stuff coming out of these conversations. And I'm like, gee, I can't wait to like carve out an hour to watch that video and do that. You know, we live in a very information inundated world. And particularly our use of the internet is a very, like the way that the interface works is a very information inundating experience. And so um, I, I totally re resonate with what has been said about the, uh, this space being like uh, a non-fragmenting space, right? But so how do, we, uh, how do we maintain that? And also I think the, the question of managing our, like, how could the platform maybe help us manage our own attentional desires more and, and better so that we are able to pay attention or, or kind of share the attention paying to critical things that are emerging um, in a way that doesn't just overwhelm where all of us are, are have 20 tabs open of conversations that we want to get to. And some of us can't get there as fast as others. And so there's different paces involved. Um, and how do we honor that? So I'd love to just explore some of those things. Uh, just a quick question, if I can throw it in here. John, do you consider a like a response? Uh, well, I think we have those little hearts. Yes. If, if you just... Yeah, if you click the heart... Tap, it, tap, uh, I'll know someone read it. Right. You and, don't and, even have to respond. But right. at least and that's, and, that's, and that's the thing. A lot of times... If someone's read it, that's fine. Right. They Caroline brought this up. Sometimes you want to think about what you're going to, you know, 
Yeah. I, I have learned in the course of my life that every once in a while, it's not too bad if I think about what I'm going to say before I say it. <laughs> but we also get distracted along the way, and then we don't get back to it. And that's, that's because, um, as, as fate would have it, there's only 24 hours in a day. And for some reason, people think they have to sleep. I, I, don't, I don't get this. But, you know, see, if we were all machines, we wouldn't have to. But we do. Because that's just part of how we are. So, so a lot of times I'll, I'll scroll through a thread and I'll see things. Today was one of those days where all of a sudden, you know, like 14 posts pop up in the thread. And, and I, can, I, can, I can skim through them. And I can go back and read a couple of them. But I can tell you that, you know, being retired is when you have zero time. So what you do, John, going, well, I'm going to go back and look at the video again, and I'm going to take oh, notes. Like, okay, it ain't gonna, it's never going to happen with me. <laughs> you know, I, as much as I admire that and I would like to, it's just not going to happen because I don't have the time. If I don't get it the first time through, I think this is one of the reasons I'm a big bugaboo, a big bugbear about, about clarity. You know, like say what you have to say. <laughs> I don't want to have to go over this ten times until I get it. If I have to do that, you're not being clear, and I got other things to do. And so I kind of dismiss it. I probably shouldn't be doing that, but it's it's uh, it's, it's it's like has been brought up more than once. It's a survival strategy in a digital world where we actually do get un- inundated with more things, information or knowledge or whatever. Than we used to do, and and we have to we have to learn how to manage that. And and I can tell you that after doing this for the last thirty years, I'm getting tired of it. You know, I'm getting tired of always having to be on top of things. I, I don't want to be on top of things. I, you know, Doug will relate to this. I want to be out on the porch on the rocking chair, <laughs> and I don't need any internet flow. I don't want it plugged in. I don't want it electrified. I, I just want to be out on the rocking chair because. All of my life, I've always yearned for that time, and it still isn't there yet, you know. And, and, that, and that is a little bothersome for me when I go, okay, well, is it ever going to come? Because I, I would love to have, I'm, Marco mentioned this in the post today, sometimes I think slow. I always think slow. I, you know, you know, the turtle is my totem. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm an extremely slow thinker. Until I get something, it can take forever. But I, in order to get it, I have to think about it long and hard. And I have to go, you know, and, and so having the opportunity to toss something out here and there to get a little bit of feedback, as you put it, John, on these kind of things and kind of like put your toe in the water, get a feel for it. That lets me know whether I need to think more about it or maybe less about it or don't need to focus on it at all. Those are, those are also very important signals. But they're not necessarily traces that we leave here in the digital world as we're moving through them. And that's why hitting a, I usually hit like, because I do like what people say, but to let the, per, the person know I read this, at least as I, however I read it, and I didn't find anything offensive about it. That's why I usually respond, and it's something curmudgeon because <laughs> because I don't, you know, silence is a scent. Absolutely. That's the, that's the general feeling. That's why Arthur Young said, okay, well, the first decision that a photon makes is to say, no, I'm not going through that slit. And that, and, and that's to me is a very profound and insightful um, um, statement that is then made. So saying no is, is something <laughs> that's going to sound weird too, but it's something very positive. You say, I, I actually see that, just to slow another person's thought. I can't tell you how many times in my life I've charged down a thought road just to find out there was a dead end and I almost careened off the edge of the thing because the barrier showed up too late, those kinds of things. You know. So, um, you know, that's kind of like the other side of the of response. You know. I guess for me, somewhat tying in what we've been saying, um, I'd like to go back to just all the key doc post that you did post, um, it is under Mindful AI. So typically, if it has a person <laughs> behind it, which I know Mindful AI is one of you, uh, there's your name right there, Marco. Yeah. <laughs> but but um, you blown my cover. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's one of the roles. <laughs> but I, I just look back and yeah, there's no hearts, there's no likes, there's no responses. And even though 
the entire time from the day it was posted, I, I brushed right through to kind of infuse what was going on as I've been doing with the entire sites, uh, documents or videos or gifts or this and, uh, readers underground that. And, um, I, I've, I've been kind of infusing what this site is all about and to articulate it, I'm definitely light years away from that. So that's why I ended up emailing the two of you and maybe posting my, my completely off the cuff kind of response. Like, okay, I give up. I'm, I can't come up with any criticism. I can't see anything wrong with this, but at the same time, there's no response to it. And I, I feel this is the most important part of the Cosmos Co-op is this, these key docs here, because well, the video that you guys um, created a, maybe a year or two ago, uh, the nine minute, like what is Cosmos video, kind of sums up a lot of what is in these, um, these documents here. But yeah, to give criticism as, like Jeffrey, I feel is the first person to give legitimate criticism um, out of everyone, and like Ed saying, we we are we're kind of stuck on John's first question. Like, what do we like about each other? What, but what don't we like? And that's hard to articulate when we just like so much about what's going on here, and it's already being articulated so well. Uh, so I'm I personally am working on my European asshole qualities. So I'll get around. <laughs> I'll get back to Uber you. critic here. <laughs> but, um, that, that's definitely a trait I want to develop as my inner critic. That's, I do see issues with, with the site. I, I mentioned once it does go beyond six or seven people on a video or six or seven people posting at a time to communicate, it will become uh, all hell breaks loose in a certain sense. Maybe, maybe not in that sense, but so what, what do we do with that? Um, what are you guys planning on doing with that? What's your plan? <laughs> okay, who's got a plane? <laughs> <laughs> Which I know that's been yeah thought about. I'm sure for the past year and a half, <laughs> however long you guys have been putting this together. Like, well, what do we do after we get past this? <laughs> and so it. thought has been had. I think like a big part of, and actually a fair amount of what we've spent time talking about today has to do with the integrity of kind of the cultural norms or the patterns that we model to each other because we're, we're primates right we, we imitate what, what is modeled to us and so in this space if we are modeling certain things to each other then then that sets a, a kind of norms of behavior for new people coming in and the idea being to try to maintain some integrity of of what works in these spaces um even as new people come in um although that, you know, the idea of a, a crisis of suddenly a thousand people joining overnight is something we haven't really grappled with. Um, but we, you know, because right now it's very much like, let's go slow, let's take our time, feel out, make sure, we, you know, we feel confident in what works. Um, but there's, you know, so there's some programming that can occur in the cultural space of how we go about things, how we do things, what are our norms? You know, for instance, the idea of the questions over assumptions, like instead of making statements, pose it as a question, and that kind of is what I raised in the thread. That's one example of, gee, could that be a, a helpful norm in in what we're trying to in fulfilling on what we're trying to accomplish here collectively? But there's also programming the platform, right? There's programming the interface and the kind of the different features that get built out to serve these purposes as well. And yeah, I mean, all of those <laughs> things. Uh, just need need attention and need support and something that I've felt that I've struggled with and I appreciate you, you raising this um, Doug is about you know the the key docs are things that Marco and I have incubated over a long period of time and I took ownership of you know the final draft and publishing and um, without feedback on the actual vision for where we're going together it's scary <laughs> to be like well maybe there isn't the buy-in like you said John no comment is a comment right and maybe and i what i what i feared from the way it was presented is that you know maybe the way it was presented wasn't sufficient to actually encourage the kind of participation requested and required for this to be truly validated by the community so 
Uh, in which case, the no comment is very scary. It's like maybe there is not the validation and not the actual sufficient support for this to move forward. But it could also be a failure of how it's presented or how you know it's framed. And, and so there's all of this is learning. It's feedback that the organization can learn from. So, um, so yeah. But anyway, I'm, I don't know. That was kind of a jumbled like thought, but I'm done talking. Specifically <laughs> there, if I could just troubleshoot one piece, because Doug, Doug gave us a good clue when he said that the post on the forum was attributed to mindful AI, which is a function of how the website specifically, the technology of it, cosmos.coop is integrated with the forum that those posts to be connected such that the comment stream shows up on the, the website, uh, you know, the website page, the more public facing page uh, it's attributed to mindful AI. It doesn't have to be that way, but it was that way. And that may be amongst others, one signal to a potential reader and interlocutor that there isn't maybe the person there like and that you know that would just be a quick and false assumption but mm -hmm. it could be just an interface issue in that in that sense uh and to be aware of that could be you know something that we take care of that we address uh not just in the respect to this particular you know set of documents but also as part of a design feature or part of a functionality that we think about and kind of mindfully uh, you know, code, you know, into our interface and into our organizational processing or communications that, you know, sets things up as readily as possible so that when you or myself or any of us want to initiate something, uh, pr propose something, move something forward, that it's, it's as, it's as facilitated as possible, like from every level. Uh, and you're really able, as the um, author of that, to, uh, to do what you do best uh, while letting the kind of bigger context of the interface and what you know, the organization as a whole is, is doing really support that. Uh, and if we could do that for each other and set things up so that you know, really we can move forward uh, with as little kind of unnecessary resistance. I mean, some resistance is good. It helps us think. Uh, and the resistance actually is just indent is going to be part of this. It's part of just the dynamic, but um, I'm really interested in those specific questions. And then of course, then that initiates a to do item, for example, somebody has to go and change how that's set up. And usually that's me. Um, but I would like, what I would like to have happen is that as much of what can be automated in this, uh, platform or in this uh, venture, uh, as much as can be automated, is automated. And what cannot be, what is most purely the human element, is really given to the, um, you know, is given its due. Uh, and it's given to the humans who are here showing up and uh, taking ownership uh, of those items. Uh, I think if Cosmos can accomplish something in the sort of meta scheme of you know, the evolution of uh, humanity or one thing it can contribute to, one problem space it could work on is specifically this interaction between, uh, you know, we could talk about in terms of AI and the human or technology and, and consciousness. But I'm of the, I'm, I've come to the conclusion, I guess, that, that uh, um, uh, you know, temporary conclusion at any rate, that if it can be scripted, if it can be automated, uh, then what do I care? Like, I don't, if I don't need to do it and I could focus on not just necessarily sitting on the porch, you know, watching, watching the kids play, I would like to do that too. And I, I do like to do that, but also the real visionary stuff, like the real out there stuff, the questions that are not answered, that the poetry that can't be written by uh, an algorithm. That's what I want to uh, devote my time, energy, attention, and life to. Uh, so if, anything that I don't have to do, you know, that somebody else could do better or a machine could do better. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to, I want that to happen um, for all of us. I mean, that to me is a value proposition. Um, when the machines are working for you, instead of you being sucked into their, you know, the agenda of the machine masters, uh, that's the sort of liberate, liberational, I think, aspect of this, but it's damn hard uh, because I'm not a, 
programmer. Uh, I can't write it all myself. I mean, what we're talking about is really, a, it has to be a collective project. It has, to, it, it can't be an individual's, you know, own, um, you know, well, I mean, there, there's a say, there's that saying, if you want to go far, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, uh, go together. And I think this is one of those situations where like, yeah. If we can bring our minds together and we can bring in the talent and attract the, you know, the expertise, the genius, really, uh, that can work on the same problem set, we could actually make an innovation. That's, uh, that's, that's why I think we need, really need a John bot, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> like, if I envision, and I can go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> if I envision about John bot was the first one that came to my mind, but just going off what you're saying, Marco, that's like to have that quality there that version of john like his personality his his being there able to like the clean space the clean language idea it like john you personally could not take care of that if it does go beyond the cosmos cafe but to have that on the forum whether it's just a video of you saying hi here's some questions to ask yourself or whatever well, to be or honest with programmer you. go ahead um well the clean questions are derived from the work of David Grove, whom I studied with. And I studied with people who'd studied with David. Um, so it's a, it's a school of thought that's emerging. And they're in the therapy world, and uh, I'm not. I'm not interested in doing that. Um, I'm interested in using clean language in, for developing collaboration, creativity, working with artists and visionaries interests me. Um, but it's very interactive. You can memorize the clean questions in an hour. But if you don't know how to listen for certain kinds of information, because it, I think the magic of that particular process comes out of a cluster of questions that are uh, arises out of the relationship, which is non-judgmental. The questions are neutral. I'm not bringing my metaphorical constructs, and you don't have to explain yourself to me. Those things that we take for granted as normal conversation is put aside when you're doing clean language. And that's the value of it. And it's a little off-putting to some people at the beginning because they're not used to people asking them what they want to have happen. And is there a size or a shape? Whereabouts is that? That's very weird. <laughs> you know? So I'm very grateful that um, Marco and Caroline and Ed and Doug, all of you have supported my effort here to to model the, the group using clean language because uh, it's a method and I believe methodologies are very important right now in our development. We need um, all the good methods we can find. And so anyway, that's my spiel about clean language. So just to let you know, um, I don't think that's going to be automatable anytime soon. Um, okay, it's, sorry, sorry, I kind of... It's really not. Me. It's really about listening. And what I like about clean language is I, these questions are set. And you follow the questions. If you do, you will have to listen really, really well um, so that you'll know what the next clean question could possibly be. And that's where the artistry comes in. Um, but I think the modeling a shared reality is of great interest to me. And that's where I want to take it outside of the therapy a counseling situation into a group. And this is what... Uh, Marco and Caroline, you've all sponsored me. And so um, I believe that what I think is important is that we have performers and sponsorship balanced. I see lots of people who want to perform and they'll grab the microphone and they'll be very entertaining. But that's not, I think, a, I think that's a dead end. We need, we need people who, who want to perform and who want to be sponsors as well. So uh, that's a, another key element, I think, in what I would like to have happen is our sponsorship skills and our skills as performers um, gets up to speed. And I use speed because I'm from New York and the one <laughs> New York, one, I mean, I'm in this kind of um, very fast environment. I realize some people are in a much more you know, if you're up on a mountaintop, you can be much more leisurely. <clears throat> so I think that's the challenge in our in this uh, setting as well, because we're coming from we have different tempo rhythms, and it takes me a little longer maybe to relax than probably some of you. 
um, because I just witnessed a robbery this morning. (laughs) So I'm aware that we're all, we've come from some event, we're going to some event, and we're taking these uh, moments to sort of tune into one another, and we're in different places of the globe. So it's a a very big challenge. Anyway, that's my spiel, but I hope we can um, honor these, uh, these, uh, the the sponsorship I think is very important. Um, That I want to tune into this other person and um, find those motifs and those themes that keep repeating themselves and, and hey, let's pay attention to this. And then we all start to pay attention to what this person wants to have happen. We have a lot more energy flowing in our system. So, so thank you. And I think, by the way, I just want to say, Ed, I think you're a great critic. Yeah. And I think, Marco, you're a great critic. I think we're all good critics. I'm not that good a critic. I think I'm, I could... I need a little work there, but I, I believe when you ha- when you intend to find the positive, to create um, the positive intention, you have a positive intention for this other person and their work, and that they can hear that positive intention. Mm-hmm. That's the critic's job. So you want to be in a very good state when you're delivering criticism. And I think Ed, you're very good at that. I just think when I deliver criticism, I sometimes get really nervous because I don't want to hurt someone's feelings. And I think I need to get over that. You do, Jim. You're way too polite. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're criticizing so, your own capacity. For I want to acknowledge it's the top of the hour, and Doug uh, has said he needs to go. Um, would we like to close off here? Do we feel content with this, or is there more we, we want to riff on or dive into? Just one more thing, and, and that's the uh, genius, studying genius. But I think the genius of the collaboration is what we need to be focusing our attention on. And I hope we get into the life divine or Bindo and Bergson and Bucky Fuller and all these great minds out there. And there are people who are current and alive too, we need to pay attention to. So I just think this is a, a direction I hope we can go into. I want to say too, I think that, um, and one of the things about technology, just we can bring this up in, in another talk perhaps, uh, but one of the things about technology is that if we see it as an extension of the human, as something that comes out of ourselves, and a reflection that takes up the patterning of, of ourselves, then it's not such a far stretch to imagine a John bot, metaphorically speaking. And I would much rather you know, be on that platform than a Zuckerberg bot platform. <laughs> you know? I mean, that, I think... We, How do we know he's not a bot? <laughs> I, I'm not so totally sure. Uh, I'm, but I really don't know about anything. I mean, we, yeah, yeah. there is an epistemological rabbit hole uh, around every, uh, around every yeah, yeah. apology. Um, but I, 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 I do think that, that there are two, they can be complementary dimensions. Uh, and we could always recognize that the John Bot is not experiencing anything. Is uh, a, a pattern that's, you know, repeated and augmented by whatever machine learning or whatever is going on, but that it, it is actually being encoded into an architecture uh, in the same way that we're taking the memes, the ideas, the thought processes, the conversations, the tensions, all the, all the patterning of all the, of these thinkers like, Beck, uh, like Bucky Fuller or Gebser or Sloterdijk. And we're incorporating those into our own uh, discourse and, um, I, I think into into even the organization and platform and the technology that we're developing. Uh, I think that, that's what's exciting to me about it is that, to me, this is a, a process of concretization and, and, and realization of things that I'm passionate about, things that I've been studying and reading about, and how does this all make sense? How does it all come together? And it can come together theoretically, but that's a lot less fun than it coming together in actuality. Uh, and... So that's what drives me is the will to manifestation of, you know, of, of something beautiful. Uh, and I, um, uh, I, I, what I would, uh, what I'm, what I like is that, that you show up and that, you know, you, you bring, um, a, uh, you know, a, um, a diversity and an unex- unexpectedness and um, uh, a depth uh, that might have been, um, you know, foreign to me. 
uh, into the into the vision to to enlarge it. Uh, I'd, so, I would actually like to say a little more before, uh, well, not before Doug leaves, but you know, as as we uh, transition, mm-hmm. or kind of we, allowing we him go, to transition. We can go over time for me. I, I'm. I, I always tend to say over my you must go stay. So please continue. Uh, That's not a great habit. I just have to say. Uh, <laughs> I'm supposed to be working. Man speaking from experience. <laughs> Um, I have a comment, but I don't think it fits in here. That was going to be kind of my closing question on the, but yeah, I'll, I'll post it elsewhere. Go ahead, Marco. Um, well, now, now I now have to hear your comment. Please. I want to hear your comment. Okay, um, so <laughs> it's, it's not necessarily, it's maybe constructive criticism, positive criticism, uh, but the, I'm not looking for the financial donations from everybody, but I'm looking for the financial structure. Like, what does it take to keep you guys going? And I I can give you a whole spiel of what I don't have, internet connection, this and that, how much I, how frugal I am, but this is literally the only group that I've provided financial support for. (laughs) It's about that much, I'm sure, for the project uh, goals, but I, I, that shows you how much I care and how much it means to me and to have a financial outlook whether i can contribute more or not is important to me um, so that's what i have to contribute there looks like you guys will have to uh, keep going too jeffrey's here hello jeffrey hi jeffrey hi, um, thank, Sorry, thank you I for that action item time, we will so. work on that mark on hi jeff hi i lost track of the time so i'm sorry Ms. <laughs> <laughs> really? How can one do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, we usually we usually go um, till we usually go ninety minutes, and we've been tending to run over to almost two hours. I think two hours for me is kind of the limit because yeah. I do yeah, have yeah. to do other things, and my brain starts to get kind Melt. of weird. <laughs> or. Um, but since Jeffrey's coming in, maybe it would be a good moment to. And Douglas is Douglas uh, exiting. Uh, to look back to the f- first hour of the conversation, could we summarize? Could we, in some way, uh, kind of catch Jeff- Jeffrey up to speed, and then go from there for as much time as we all have up to another hour? Mm-hmm. Works yeah. for me. Um, I won't have that much time, <laughs> but all y'all right. can keep talking. This is recorded, so I can mm-hmm. always tune back in later to catch the rest. So what's your limit? I don't have one. I have a preference for going for no more than the next 20 minutes because it's been an hour at this point. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Gotta do. Well, what, what, perhaps we can just start with this question. What have we learned in the last hour? And that'll. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, I think the, um, I, I just wrote down collaborating at your best is like what? Um, since we have some dynamic reference points already, um, I mentioned Trumpocalypse and um, Caroline and Marco both shared that this was a collaboration. So I would pose that, not necessarily now, but in the future as a, a good research question. Um, when you're collaborating at your best, that's like what? You get a metaphor, you can develop that. And, and uh, I, I'll tell you the story. I had a, I had a partner, someone I was working with, uh, trying to create a professional situation with this person. And someone asked us, when you're learning at your best, that's like what? And I was like, I was like a space cadet on another planet, you know, um, getting, receiving radio signals from UFOs and all this stuff. And I see footprints on the sand on this other planet, and it, the footprints lead to a, a hole. And I'm this is my metaphor, right? That's me learning at my best. Then they ask my partner, What's learning at your best? And she says, Well, it's like a file cabinet. And I have everything filed in the right place, and it's all in alphabetical order. And then I just sort of knew, Well, this is not going to work out. <laughs> No wonder we've had problems. I love this lady. She's very smart. And we're both interested in very similar things. But that was then. But now I think now I may be able to work with people 
who have that kind of a different, a radically different metaphor than myself. And um, I believe that would be uh, me crossing over into another cat. You know, I would be able to say, okay, this is her metaphor and she's entitled to it. A foul cam, and I'm, and I'm a, you know, out in outer space. Is there something in my metaphor she can use? Is there something in her metaphor I could use? And I would say now, looking back on that, there probably was a lot that I could use. So I believe that's a, a the, the experiment for me is how can we all have a metaphor that works for us and we each know what each other's metaphor is. So we are not just um, making... Um, these unhappy trade-offs because we don't know why this person's so cranky or hard to get along with. Well, if we like make explicit some of these metaphors, we start to realize, oh, this makes sense now why we've had these uh, problems. So anyway, that's my, my future pace for me would be, oh, I would love to like study um, when we're collaborating at our best. That's like what, just as we worked on when you're writing at your best mm -hmm. and you and I, we did some clean space, Marco. Um, anyway, if I had anybody who would be curious about that, I would love to do that. And I'm also wanting, wanting to study each of you are a genius. That's my assumption here. <clears throat> Underneath the surface, there's a genius. I know I sound a little bit like Tony Robbins, but I think it's... <laughs> <laughs> John, that would, be, that would be really appreciated um, to really explore that as a branch of this inquiry as to what we want Cosmos to become. I mean, very much so, I resonate with the idea of drawing out our best in each other. So asking what are we like when we collaborate at our, at our best would be really valuable. So that's my spiel. Thank uh, yeah, you. And I posted a video um, by... Uh, a woman whose name I'm not gonna, is not going to come back to me, but uh, the title of it was Collective Genius. If you do a search on the forum for Collective Genius, uh, there's a TED Talk uh, given by a, re a Harvard researcher who uh, studied uh, highly creative uh, organizations. And she's working mainly in the corporate world, and so she's looking at Pixar and a, a manufacturing uh, company in Hong Kong and a few other places like that. But she, it's, it, it's an interesting video because she detects patterns in how groups of people work together to produce these extraordinary results. Uh, that was inspiring uh, to me um, because uh, I would, uh, I'm drawn to that kind of scenario. Uh, I'd like to be a participant in that kind of uh, space, that kind of activity the uh, really br the bringing forth of of genius and collective genius uh, you know that could just be a ca catchphrase or a slogan but i think it, it could also be a real thing uh and <laughs> and and so it's exciting to me that we can ask these kinds of questions pursue these inquiries and actually at, get to some testable hypothesis uh that we could apply to ourselves uh to see what happens uh and uh you know, see what, uh, that's exciting to me. That's all I can say. Um, and uh, since I'm talking, like what I've learned from this last hour or so is, is that there is some shared, I think, desire for uh, some variety of an outcome uh, like that, which, you know, is really pers reflects a, one person, a personal dimension of where we are, are in our life, our personal history, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all of everything that makes us us as individuals. But I think there is a nexus here uh, of shared intention and desire where we could uh, elaborate on these conversations and build things out and attract the other minds, the other talents, the other genii who would, you know, each take, each own their piece of it. Uh, and Doug mentioned the ownership piece uh, or the financial piece, which uh, to me really has to be resolved in, in terms of ownership. In terms, and that's why the cooperative model was something that I became very interested in and began to learn about took seriously because it is an ownership structure. It's a way of transparently and uh, uh, rationally, according to a set of values uh, that uh, you know, all participants are, can be aware of, can agree to, can consent to, of organizing activity. Uh, and 
uh, managing those flows of time, money, energy, attention, etc. Uh, I, I, I would like to develop that uh, because otherwise, and I think this is perhaps also getting to Jeffrey's uh, point on the forum, the power is, um, it's kind of a black box. It's in, it's in like my head or in conversations that have occurred but haven't really been distilled into uh, documentation or haven't been exposed to um, public uh, uh, scrutiny. Um, I mean, I, I would like there to be as much of an artistic and visionary quality to this that's coming out of our individual inspiration, as much of that as a, a scientific and uh, economic and rational perspective that looks at the objective uh, flows and patterns of things and attempts to really regulate them uh, in, in, in a meaningful way. I, I think that that's appropriate, that balance between structure and openness. And the, pro the limitation I've come to is my own personal bandwidth to, of what I can do uh, because I really come to this uh, you know, not as a business person, not as a, uh, a person who has, you know, uh, even worked in, in structures like that. I've avoided them all my life, in fact. And, uh, and yet here I've come to this threshold in, in my, on my particular path where I, I need to, to put my money where my mouth is. Uh, and if I'm, uh, as committed as I say I am to, or believe I am in my, you know, most um, deranged moments uh, to some uh, greater reality and its instantiation, it's like uh, embodiment in, in the world, then I have to, <laughs> I have to follow through on, on the poetry. The poetry I think has to become um, uh, effective in the world. And so uh, I'm really, I have come to the, li the limits of my map uh, on that. And I, I have places on my map. I have, there is a, there is a, a topology uh, that, that I'm expressing and embodying. And I've named all the, you know, I've named a kind of proto universe uh, of uh, projects and functions and structures. Uh, but now I need others. <laughs> I need the others who uh, will help in their, you know, in their respective ways uh, to to bring that forth. And so, um, I've learned that. Uh, so well, uh, that's why we're here. Uh, and um, I'm I'm throwing myself into this process. <laughs> and I'm along. For, I'm going for the ride. <laughs> I know the feeling, Marco. I uh, helped support my uh, my daughter's business until the financial crisis hit us and took us out. But that was also to be expected at the time, and we were in a very commercial sector. Uh, what you're trying to do is exceedingly admirable. I'm personally um, more than impressed of how much you are able to handle. But I also have a great, great sympathy for what you're saying. Um, I know what those limits look like. And to put it, to put it in business terms, you've, you've chosen an impossible task, which is always difficult to, uh, to realize, because you want to, you want to combine something creative with something that kind of looks, let's say, business-like. I don't think businesses have to look like businesses. I don't think that's important. Um, I think that there's way too much emphasis placed on those kind of things. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Peter Drucker's um, uh, definition. of We have Milton Friedman's, the purpose of business is business. And when you say, well, what's that? And then, well, the purpose of business is the maximization of profits. That's the one we have now. Drucker always said that if you're fulfilling a need in a market, whatever needs are as they are defined and whatever markets are as they may uh, constitute themselves. Um, my words, not Peter Drucker's, if you're not a complete idiot, you will turn a profit because you are providing something that people need. And there's just a natural, a somewhat natural process. It's an artificial process because we made it up. But there's a somewhat natural process about bringing that all to fruition so that something remains in the end. And you want two things to remain. You want to have a little bit of 
whatever that oil is that, that, that uh, greases the wheels of doing this in business. So we need to have a little bit of money. And you want to have something lasting in, this, in the sense that there's something artistic, and there's something humanly worth being interested in that we can, we can come to. And those are, those are very contradictory things. But we're living in the, in the, this comes up again and again, we're living in the, the era of paradox. And so, okay, this is a good time to be doing that, I think, because um, it's not so unusual that we would think paradoxically in that regard. We've done that before. Um, one, of the, one of the problems, if you want to call it that, that I, I have with the docs, I'm bookmarked the page. It must have been up there for weeks. Every time I want to go at it, something came up and I got away <laughs> from it. Um, but if, but if, I had, if I had one thing to say about them, they're too long. And because in an online world, the moment I have to hit the scroll bar to see what's next, I'm done. I, I can't do it. It takes too much time. And I firmly believe, I don't know how this is done. I was in a PhD program, well, I was actually in a D program at one time, trying to figure this out on the design of online platforms, actually online learning platforms. Because we have a population out there where the real freaks have a longer attention span, but most people don't. So you've got, whatever you have to say, you got to say quickly. It's the old journalistic principle. You say what you have to say in the first paragraph, you sum it up in the last paragraph, and everything in between are the details that nobody really cares about, but the really interested people will read them. That's how newspaper articles were written at one time. I don't know how newspaper articles are written anymore because I haven't seen one in a long time. And every time I get into one, it's like, are you ever going to make a point? That, which is another person. But anyhow, Can I, I think you have to, what? I'd like to respond to several things you said. If I'm I could. sure. I, I wasn't done with my sentence, but go ahead. Well, yeah, please, please continue. I just, I was trying to feel for when I could jump in and I was having trouble doing so. That's okay. Jump in now. That's all right. Okay. Um, well, the one, the thing about the, the key docs length, um, yeah, in terms of what's public facing, sure, we can, we can synthesize to, to smaller nuggets. Um, but I think what's really important for, for me is that the integrity of the thinking behind the reasoning behind the model, because more, the future docs that will be published are going to go deeper into the actual model of the organization and the platform, um, that, that that not be lost to people. Because it, it's easy to read a paragraph and think you yes. understand and just make yes. assumptions. And each each person doing that only causes more distortion in theory. So that's something I wanted to No, no in practice. That. Not just in theory. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm with yeah. you. Yeah. 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 Um, and then with regard to the talking about the organization, so um, Doug had asked to publish the finances and, and, and we have the opportunity to do that through um, a tool that we use called mm -hmm. Open Collective. Yeah. That and, and also publishing a bit more clearly about what our needs are to mm -hmm. expand mm -hmm. the platform from it just yep. being on the shoulders of like Marco primarily. Um, I think that we're on the brink of doing that. And we have some actual methods in mind for rolling out that information and, and um, kind of catalyzing more integral um, participation on these matters. Um, that Marco is going to be working on tomorrow, actually, with regard to uh, kind of an expansion of metapsychosis and of, of a blogging platform as a feature of Cosmos to our members. Um, and uh, I think that the transparency, like we, we will be, we will be doing that more, and the transparency, and also making explicit the asks around the transparency of like. So this is, you know, this is where we're at and this is the ideal state. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, we, how, how can we as a collective move right. in that direction? And so empowering that collective action, we're, we're really close to, to that. And the key docs mm -hmm. are an experiment in that direction mm -hmm. too. Um, and, and what I'm, I, I got a lot from this conversation. I took, I posted notes in yes. the Google docs on the little sidebar there mm -hmm. um, that I took um, and it'll help fuel the next iteration and the evolution of, of the docs and of the model more, more broadly. So, um, yeah. So definitely we're, we're on the, we're at the brink of that more sophisticated, more distributed moving towards what we do share as a common, common aspirations. And I was happy, as Marco said, 
you know, I also heard a, a fair amount of consonants and overlap today. So that was nice mm -hmm. to, to think about, okay, well, what can we resource to move on, to move on these initiatives we have, we share. Yes. Okay, so now I'll finish the, my, my sentence because I, I agree 100% with what you said, Caroline. And the point that I want, or where I wanted to go with the whole thing was, I think the texts don't need to be shortened. They need to be hypertexted. They need to be constructed. We need, to, we need to structure them differently so that people aren't over, you know, I'll say it very bluntly. And like I, when I go in and I see that the, the scroll bar is only that big, I'm going, oh, I got a lot to read. But if I can read something and it has my interest and there's a link to something that it takes that a little deeper, that it takes it to, a, to another, I will follow that link and I will read that as well. And I will end up probably reading more than I ever thought I would ever read if I would, hadn't been intimidated right at the beginning. That's, all, that's, that's the point that I was actually trying to make. That I don't think that there's anything in there that we just throw away or can just discard. It just, we need to structure this differently. This is what Marco was also saying with the, you know, you come to the limits of, you know, what the technology can do for you. And I understand his point as well, because I tried to do the, the, the IT for our, my daughter's business. It's too much work for what you get done. You have to invest way too much time. That's why I'm completely off on the uh, AI singularity that's just around the corner. Bullshit. We can't get this stuff to work. You know, it doesn't work smoothly. I had to spend two hours yesterday getting my, my power lines back on, so I have Wi-Fi in the house, and I had to spend another hour this evening um, diddling around with my wife's email because for some reason it didn't want to send anything out. You know, it's like if we can't get this sorted, you know, I don't want to see a robot. <laughs> I don't care what it does. I don't even want, I don't want it near me, you know, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to injure me in some way. You know, that's my trepidation in that regard. We don't have a grip on. It. So, so, you know, being very sensitive to that and being aware of that, I think that's an area that we can continue to think about. How do we get the platform to do everything it possibly can? I'm all for that, even though I'm not the big AI guy. And I think that we need to think about restructuring these things. And I know that's not a, an individual effort either, because that's what I was finding out in the research for my own disc. Um, that's a hard thing to do. It's an extremely hard thing to do. So, but that, that's just the, that was the, the critique, but the reinforcement, <laughs> what you're doing is right. You know, let's just figure out how we can do it better. Yeah, I would see it maybe in a modular fashion uh, where the key docs are, yeah. they're, they're aggregations of, of thoughts and processes that yeah. could okay. be composed and recombined in different ways that mm -hmm. uh, just provides more accessible, more chunk, chunked, uh, chunk bite size, yeah. uh, I might say, um, access points like into the, you know, the a perspective mm -hmm. on, on the thing as a whole. Uh, so I, I, I think in principle, what you're describing is, is just right. And as always, like as with any thing, it's a matter of bringing attention to it and mm -hmm. actually doing it. If the AI isn't going to do it and the platform yeah. do it, then somebody's got to do it. Well, somebody uh, has to kick the AI in the butt to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I also use a lot of the times for this kind of work, I do kind of, um, you know, they used to have in the old days, uh, given that, given that, given that, mm -hmm. then uh -huh. so you, a kind of preamble bit that mm -hmm. describes the assumptions uh -huh. and then in point form the conclusions so that people can skip to the conclusions and then go back to read the preamble mm -hmm. afterwards which is more the way people tend to work mm -hmm. there also is an algorithmic element to this i think and, and that's that it's if we do if we think things through and this is that my understanding of what an algorithm is, mm. it's just a set of defined processes for getting a result. Mm. Uh, you name the result that you want, and then if you can define the steps to get that result, then you establish a sequence, of, um, a, a sequence that can be run uh, with input and an output. And there's an aspect, of course, the listening, the presence, the actual participation, the actually showing up, the actually being there, that's, that can't be done by an algorithm. 
but uh, our thinking can uh, borrow from that, you know, that, that uh, methodology uh, to, um, to solve problems, problems that we're talking about here. Uh, so what's a good way to communi- communicate aspects of the codex? What I think Jeffrey just described could be one way of formatting that communication where you could see the conclusion. And then if you need to, you can look at the steps that the author took to get there. Uh, you know, I, I, I ditched math and science uh, in, when I was a freshman in college. Uh, and I regret that I did that now because <laughs> I think that if we could marry the poetic impulse, the visionary impulse with the mathematical and scientific yeah. rigor, and then really have both elements simultaneously like going on online when we're presenting things like these ideas. I mean, that to me itself is uh, a powerful prospect. Uh, and so it's, it's really cool to have, you know, PhD in astrophysics uh, mm-hmm. to bounce ideas off of. And, uh, and then also a dramaturg and uh, someone with actual business experience and a cooperative developer. Uh, I mean, I think, identifying our respective strengths and not just identifying them, but but really allowing them to mingle in in the space because it kind of comes out in these, uh, you know, these uh, elliptical ways sometimes. Um, How our relative experience and how our our knowledge is relevant. Uh, Mm -hmm. I, uh, having, yeah, I mean, just the fact that we have a space for that is to me very encouraging. Uh, and it helps me trust that appropriate structures will arise as coherence develops amongst the, uh, the perspectives that are in play here. And it's, the, it's about the time, Caroline, Caroline that you said you uh, want to be uh, getting off. So, is there anything, is, uh, is there a way we could, um, the way you'd like to uh, wrap this up or to transition? Thank you. Um, I don't know, <laughs> though. Um, <laughs> I mean, I feel like this is just, it's scratching the surface, well, of a bottomless conversation, right? Like, <laughs> so no, it's just, <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so it's just, uh, I don't know what to say to segue because it's just going to be something that we keep exploring and hopefully with things like the key docs and Marco and I putting out more of this like transparency around what it takes to resource certain things and and move in certain directions as far as, you know, coordinating our energy towards certain, uh, certain um, features or expansions of what we're doing that that is a discussion that's a debate right as to like whether we want to go in that direction and and it'll bring up these deeper themes so i think on those platforms and uh we we will continue these conversations there's also the potential for having cosmos cafe style video conferences just not at this same time but uh, specifically on the subjects of developing cosmos.coop which involves the community and its norms it involves the platform technological implementation um, and also the organization so it's kind of a trifecta of juicy stuff to dive into and try to you apply our collective intelligence to figure out where we want to go with it so that's the kind of stuff i love and i'm passionate about so i'll be leading those conversations most likely um, but yeah we will see what happens next <laughs> thanks all for your for your participation. Great feedback today. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Yep. Okay. And I mean, should, should we wrap it up? Um, see, uh, so, uh, bye Caroline. That's great. Well, I could stay actually. Uh, I'm okay for another, you know, I had something I wanted to share about um, collaboration. I, I really like this best, how do we best collaborate question. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I learn on my own, and I, I kind of, well, I usually prefer to learn on my own. So hole up in a room somewhere. <laughs> and most of the way I learn on my own is by 
tackling jobs that are way, way beyond what I'm usually capable of doing. Uh, I'm, I'm a guy who wants to do a thousand percent. Even though I know I'm only going to do 60%, but I'm going to do a better 60% if I'm aiming for a thousand percent than if I'm aiming for 10%. So I, that's the way I, I structure my own learning. But I don't do that in a group because if I do that in a group, half the people will drop off, drop off. off right away. And I have years of working with um, managing multidisciplinary teams, where, which is close to the kind of collaboration that we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. And in those contexts, um, so this idea of questioning rather than assuming or questioning assumptions, one of the first things we do in a multidisciplinary context is try to, to unearth the assumptions that people are working with because across different disciplines, people have very different assumptions. And it's not easy to get assumptions because when you learn a discipline, the, ver- it, the assumptions are the very first things you learn and they're the things that get buried underneath everything else that you know. So they're very hard to bring back up to the surface to expose to other people. So although it sounds easy, getting the assumptions out is actually really, really tough. Mm-hmm. And, and so this focus on questioning assumptions, I think, is or questioning before assumptions or questioning a- assumptions mm-hmm. or, you know. So it's part of the reason why I think that knowing who people are is also interesting because our assumptions are often implicit in who we are. And the more we say about who we are, the more the assumptions emerge, whether or not we're even aware that we're making them clear. So I think that's also a a, a really important part of it. I have a lot more to say about it, but I think I'm going to write something and put it up on the, on the, on the site because I have, you know, as I said, I've been working in this kind of issue for a very long time and uh, I'm sure I can dig out more than I can say in a few words. Good. I I very much look forward to that myself, Jeffrey. I, that that's right. That's something right on my. You just spoke right out of my own heart. You know? Because that's that's one of the key things I think that we we need to do, and that too many people never get the opportunity to examine. That's why if you get to work in the transdisciplinary team where that's being done, you start learning a whole lot more about yourself and what it is that you're just assuming going in or what you have buried down in there that you simply take for granted. And then you realize how much that does color what, what it is that you think and how you approach things. And it makes it a lot easier when you recognize those and others to understand what it is that they're saying and get ideas to mesh uh, perhaps more easily than they otherwise would. You know, so if you could put something together on that, I, I think that'd be great. The other thing I wanted to say, and really quickly, um, so uh, about this issue of the arts, the literature, the the poetry, as Marco said, mm-hmm. and how do you bring that into the discussion? So I've been thinking, I, I don't have any final answers on this, but um, Johnny's extensive poem that he brought into the discussion on Slaughter Dick uh, a few days ago, ago. So I have been, um, I mean, I was enthralled reading it. And um, I find that there is no way to respond to it without responding in kind. That is to say, I can talk about it, mm-hmm. but I feel like I'm going to completely miss it if I just talk about it in rash that what I need to do is construct some sort of poetic or fictional effort in order to respond in kind to what was said. Um, And so there's a kind of a very, very strong difference between the poetic fictional way of doing things, the work, versus the rational, argumentative, discursive way. And I really still don't understand. I mean, I've worked in this divide between the two worlds for 
15 years now, but it's not an easy cross to manage in a way that articulates clearly and cross feeds across the two. So uh, I don't have any final answers, but I think it is one of the key problems that we have to face. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Jeffrey. I think this, um, I think this is crucial for our survival, that different kinds of voices are, are allowed. <clears throat> you know, and um, I'm also deeply sensitive to this. I, I get triggered by the whole idea of an algorithm. <clears throat> um, but I'm am, I do follow recipes, you know, and I do know what procedures are necessary for any good performance. So I think this, um, if we could find a way, uh, what you said, uh, Ed, earlier about in good journalism, you know, you, you get their attention and you know your conclusion has to be really juicy and what's in between is sort of, if anyone sticks it up, that's great. But when the, the same is true of a performance, mm -hmm. you hear a play or a movie, you remember the beginning, you remember the end. When you get out in the parking lot, almost everything else vanishes really fast, but you'll get a few, you know, a really great movie or a great performance resonates for years after you've seen it. You may not remember the content, but you remember a tone of voice or you remember a look. And that's where I think, um, <clears throat> you know, when you're, do I think in our <clears throat> conversations, I think it's great to be all over the place. <clears throat> and that's really exciting. Um, but I think in, as long as we set the tone right at the beginning and we have something at the end, uh, we have like a kind of, I think of a Sonato Allegro form, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and whatever happens in the middle, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you can go all over the place as long as we set that little coda at the end. I love the moment in our conversation, um, the last one, where there was that silence. And it wasn't I didn't feel like an awkward silence. It was just like everyone would just, we were all listening. And um, I believe that uh, something that you said in the, in the forum, Jeffrey, was really lovely about you're sort of, you, you sort of came up with a summary, I think, that we were all sort of waiting for. So I think these kinds of, um, um, the influences, I think, are so rich between the spoken and the written, and that we can go back and forth from these two modes. It's, I think, very exhilarating. Because I, I do believe that the, uh, the vagus nerve, I think I mentioned this, the vagus nerve is in the back of our heads, in the cranium and it goes all the way down our spine into our viscera into our heart and into our throat and to the eyes and this is the wandering nerve i like to think of it as the mobius strip inside but it's the inside and the outside our voice is communicated with the voice so this is very primary and i think even in good writing we can hear the voice so these are the kind of this is really hard to talk about, um, but I think um, uh, if we can, you know, blend the the theoretical and the meta theoretical with these uh, these sort of fuzzy affective zones, uh, and we feel safe enough to do that, so that we can be vulnerable and come forward with a, with. A, and I love what you said, Jeffrey. It'd be wonderful if people could share their poetry or their vignettes or their, their dream, the dream they had the night before. Um, I think that's when we get into these liminal zones, which are so, we're also cut off from in most of our professional engagements or, you know, our, whatever kind of work we're doing. So anyway, that's my two cents. I hope there's a way we can find a way. Can I say something real quick? Please, Doug. Um, on the way home, I have about a 20 minute drive, but uh, this ties in with my, I, I mentioned maybe on a forum or somewhere that I will, my, my poetry or my, my writing often comes to me while driving. So I'll, I'll quickly kind of jump on the voice memo to get whatever I can to extract that. But the idea came to me for our, our threads, which this may make it completely messy as I'll get out. But um, I, I recorded a video, which I'll post here in a little bit, just simply stating I, I had this idea that we can 
as I'm doing right now, have just a quick little blurb. Like I couldn't type when I had this idea. So I'm giving you a video of what I want to say. And it could be poetry, but this was just a quick statement uh, relating to what, what can we offer to like the forum, the, this, this whole conversation in general. But th it hasn't been done here. And I, I don't know if that would just turn into a big old mess, but I'll, I'll post it and see what happens. And that, that seems to be tying into what you guys are talking about. But like, when we can't spend a, 10 minutes writing an essay on a response to Ed about what he said about this the other day, um, sometimes it's better to use the voice and that would throw in a video of us and be more personal. Um, maybe that makes sense, but. I think you should try it. Why not? <laughs> yeah, That's I, I think I'm saying it's worth a try. It's just oh. I throw it up and see what, you yeah. know, like if I'm moved enough by an idea that, it, you know, I'm willing to do whatever quantum of work is necessary to kind of bring it into a space, uh, you know, I'll quickly figure out whether my calculus on that is right or wrong. Um, but uh, I, I think that it's worth moving on what you, what you feel moved by. Um, mm -hmm. And to, to tie maybe that back too to Jeffrey and John's uh, exchange, you know, one of the books that was very influential for me was, uh, I have it here, that's why I'm looking, but it was Charles Eisenstein's book called Sacred Economics. And the reason is, and I couldn't, uh, I couldn't reconstruct his full argument here, but the basic idea of it, or what it introduced to me, was an idea of a gift economy. Mm -hmm. And the gift economy, you know, as you may know anthropologically, is actually a mode of exchange of material goods uh, in you know, tribal groups um, or in smaller groups within larger societies. But it has a certain kind of quality to it that is... Uh, uh, that that is inclusive of the affective is inclusive of the intuitive uh, that um, doesn't have to be reduced to a abstract unit of exchange like a uh, monetary uh, type um, or even a rational type uh, in the way, ways that our discourses can be construed as forms of currency uh, when we have a scientific discourse and uh, there are claims and counterclaims made and evidence provided, etc. That's a certain kind of currency. But in a gift economy, uh, to me, it's the closest type of economics I could imagine to poetry. Uh, because when, when Jeffrey responds to, to John's uh, piece uh, in, that, in the spirit of that gift, or in the, you know, not to get too flowery talking about it, but in the, in the, in, in the, uh, essence of that gift. I'm, I'm terrible words for this, but that keeps it circulating. And that's the point of that economy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not exponential growth to maximize profits for, uh, you know, some mindless algorithm that's just, you know, optimize, trying to colonize the whole, the whole life world. Um, it's, it's oriented towards uh, other values, let's just say. And what are the values? Well, they are encoded into the currency uh they're not an, they're not a, they're not abstracted away from so it's in the poetry itself it's in the voice it's in the embodiment it's in the feeling it's in the experience and that i, I feel what what's circulating the question i have uh is can that be scaled can can there be a gift economy that doesn't get collapsed back into a profit uh, for profit economy a profiteering type economy and i don't want to get into a discussion about capitalism mm -hmm. right now but that that's my kind of question i don't know and in one sense it's absurd it can't be because it's singular uh in another sense it must be uh because i think if we look at the wider objective you know just reality from a real politic level uh our current, you know, our reductive economy is not working. Uh, it's it's not going to continue working uh, in the same way that it has. What, whatever scenarios we want to paint about it, uh, in an optimistic scenario, we're going to have overcapacity. Uh, we're going to have abundance, uh, and we're going to have a lot of time on our hands. So, those who uh, are uh, 
um, operating in a different kind of economy that doesn't rely on the anxiety and fear associated with scarcity mm-hmm. uh, are going to be an, an advantage in that economy because it's not going to be about who's got, uh, you know, the, the, the biggest McMansion or about, um, you know, the, the sheer accumulation of wealth for, for no good reason. Anyway, I mean, I'm kind of getting off, but that, that's part of the thinking for me behind this is that uh, I'd actually like to see that not just as a romantic idea, but as a operational uh, principle. I have a response. I do too. I, you want to go first, Ted? No, no, go ahead. Go, John. I'm all, of, I'm all for the romantic. Um, and um, I think uh, uh, Hazel Henderson, she was a colleague of um, Gregory Bateson. I remember her, she's an economist. She, she calls herself a futurist, but she made a comment about, we confuse money with wealth. Sure. And having a lot of money is not the same thing as wealth. And I just, that made so much sense to me. And she was talking about wealth has to do with the imagination. And you can have no money at all, but you have a vivid, if if you have your imagination, you're a wealthy person (laughs) as far as I'm concerned. And I think that's where, uh, you know, the economic downturn, the recession hit so many of us so hard. Um, It wasn't just that we lost our life savings or we lost our job, but we lost a lot of friends. And, uh, you know, those networks of support that we thought were very durable, they were not. They went down the tubes. And that to me, because, you know, that to me is, um, I don't know. I, I started to come away very cynical and I said, oh, well, maybe I was wrong. Maybe love equals money in our culture. And now I'm starting to come back from that. Maybe I've made some, um, I'm hoping that we can, um, our communities have been so under, under stress and have broken down. And I do believe that um, we can come together, as you've said, around Eisenstein and this gift economy, and that's great, um, and see what happens next. But I think if we're bringing our best and we're asking questions that bring out the best in others, we share our poetry, our dreams, our art. Uh, we're going to be moving in a more coherent direction. And so I just put my trust in that. And I trust, and I think I'm quoting Ursula Le Guin here, one of my favorite writers, trust yourself, trust your characters, trust your audience. Mm. Mm. I agree, John. And that, that's I'll just phrase it in a slightly different way. When, when Marco said that there's something there that we value, we value things that we need. So that's the, the need in the Druckerian sense, not in the neoliberal kind of idea of how economies are supposed to work. And if there's someone benefiting from that, then that means there's another there besides myself, and that is more or less what defines a market. It's the interaction between individuals and groups of individuals who have things that they value and things that they get because they value them. And it really doesn't mean we have to be all the material all the time. There is, there is a point at which the abundance that comes, that's the wealth. That's the one that you're talking about. That's why we're, we're saying the same things in different words. There's a lot of ways to describe the same phenomenon. That's what I like about this. Um, is what, what the, the neoliberals call profit. Because there's something left over in the end. There's something that you can build on. There's something that you can put back in to this whole interaction. Call it a system, if you will. I don't like the word it's limiting. But you put back in, it causes the system to continue to function and and then expand as well. So what you're saying, Marco and and John reinforced that, I I really do think this is the way to go. We simply need to get over that the only thing is the money. You know, the money's the least of it. Kind of what we need because of the circumstances we have right at the present time. But that doesn't mean that they're always going to be there or that they will always be configured in this way. Those two are changing. A lot 
I, I, I do think for as curmudgeonly as I am most of the time, there's a lot of people who are realizing that there are other values and those values are probably more valuable than the one we, we've reduced it all to, which is money. Everything that's out there right now is very reductionistic. And I think it's about time that, that most people realize there's, that's a, it's a dead end street. You can only reduce so far until you have nothing. Even people who have a lot of money, you know, who've yeah. been very successful uh, in, in in the game of yeah. in, innovation or finance or what have yeah. you, I think are coming to a, a perspective that puts that has them um, looking for where, how, and where to cultivate uh, these yeah. other forms of value. Yes, uh, yes, because they you, you real at some point you realize it, you know. It might be nice to have a whole lot of money, but I don't think that's a problem I want to have, to be perfectly honest with you. you know, there, there's just too much negative that can be associated with that. You know, I, I, I have to do with, make do with what I have. That's why I feel most comfortable. And I think they, you realize, you, find, you did, you beat, the, you beat the system. You gained the system. You, you're right at the top. And you feel better. And, and most of them don't. I, I, I really believe I, I hear this in a lot of what they're saying. And, and, and when I when I see all these really botched attempts at trying to do something good that end up being end up, bad, you know, because how, how would they know what to do with it? You know, they were playing a whole different game. Now they have to learn rules to a whole different game. You know, the philanthropic game is not the, the money game. It's not the, you know, being generous is not the same as being stingy. If you've been stingy all your life, what do you do now? No, you got to turn. Well, no, it's like Jesus said, turn around, turn around the kingdom. Well, John the Baptist, turn around, turn around. The kingdom of God is at hand. OK, well, you got to turn around and then you're going, oh, shit, I got to do that. Oh, no, that's not the way it is. It's the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Well, that's what you have to do now. So no, go do it. That, that's what he tells the guy. You know? Well, I have to do it again. Well, go do that. Yeah. Give away everything. Go do that. <laughs> ah. Scary. But. I think the realization is there and it's spreading. No. And, that, and, I, and that makes me hopeful. It's also part of why I ultimately don't regret my philosophy degree. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm a genius, Marco. You know, I, I started out in that. I go, okay, give it up. And I'm going, oh, I can use it today. Okay. But, you know, you do what you can with what you have. At the time you do it. One thing I have to say, I don't have any regret. You know, it would be nice, but... Uh, it's not really a regret, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> you know? otherwise I wouldn't be where I am and I wouldn't be talking to you. If I decided to become a math major, I would not be talking with you people today. Because <laughs> I would have gone somewhere, I would have gone a whole different path. I never would have ended up here. That, that's the whole idea about causality and choices that we make. You know? That one doesn't get me here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I'm here. Okay. So it was I'm right. glad you're here too, Ed. <laughs> so it was the right choice. Yeah. That's all I see it. All right. And I, think, I think we're getting in touch with the inner group here. Yeah. <laughs> Even <laughs> when, I'm not, when I leave these calls, um, you know, I walk down the street and I'll remember something. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, oh, I think, uh, you know, Ed would really like this. Or yeah. You know, yeah. I think this is something Jeffrey would enjoy. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I have this in the back of my mind, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think there is an inner group that nourishes us. And yeah. I think that's a very, um, that's very evolutionary, mm -hmm. you know? And I think we need that. In whatever form we can find it, community is under, under stress. Mm -hmm. Communities are breaking up all over the place. So I, I think we need to create this, moving towards that coherence, that, um, of others of a like mind can provide without getting too much into the clubhouse thing. I think mm -hmm. that's a danger too, you know. We don't want to create a, you know, <laughs> barriers. Uh, anyway, thank you very much. Well, that's well, a, I mean, that, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, we can just bookmark it. We don't have to really explore it in depth because it's something that I, I'm, I feel that I am sensitive to and I want to be, I don't mm -hmm. want to become desensitized to it partly because I came out of uh, an experience through Integral, in Integral Institute, which is extremely open uh, in, in so many ways, but even still, ultimately, I think, succumbed to 
a, a club type ideological mm-hmm. mentality. Right. Uh, and it's very easy for that to happen uh, in a group of people because that's just what people do. They create yeah, <laughs> uh, ideology. <laughs> uh, and so poetry helps with that. Music helps with that. Mm-hmm. To me, the, these are forces which when they're in a, in a, di- a dynamic uh, harmony and with with forces of order uh, not let me not actually that's the wrong dichotomy but with um, uh, with more conventional let's say thinking or habits that get get built up I think can create uh, maintain a healthier milieu a, mm. a healthier culture right uh, and so coming out of integral thinking as a discipline and as an, a framework uh, now I'd like to say, well, I got that down. I, I don't need to like mm-hmm. learn the conceptual you know, schema anymore. Uh, but knowing that abstractly, that of course it makes sense to have the, the balance of these different forces, uh, art and science and interior and external and, you know, profit and purpose or whatever kinds of ways that we could combine elements into a greater whole that, uh, actually doing it is the what matters Uh, Mm. and so like i do also feel this these centrifugal forces Uh, i think that you know they're not just sociological realities that but they're felt realities i feel them uh in my interactions with people in my in my in my life uh so uh this is my this for me is an attempt to to meet a need it's mm-hmm. an attempt to meet that need for the, the group mind as a dimension of my being. Not the only thing. I'm not assumed mm-hmm. in the group mind. But mm-hmm. It's a dimension of what I need to function as a healthy, whole human being. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, it didn't work out at Integral Institute. You know, it didn't work out in 10 years of Facebook. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, and... and uh, also, I, I have to confess to being an ambitious person. Uh, there's an aspect that arises as part of my compound personality that wants to create something that's bigger than myself and uh, that has, a, uh, you know, has a, a cloud of glory. <laughs> that, that I, I want glory. Mm-hmm. Not for myself personally necessarily, no. but I want to participate in it. Yeah. Uh, and... Um, and have you know have, have, have yeah that's it serve it but 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 enjoy it as well uh, and so what does that look like to me concretely that looks like writing poetry myself and doing videos too and uh, producing movies or something like uh, the sky's the limit uh, actually I I would like to participate in projects that are visionary and that are exciting and that are effective. Uh, in the world, uh, and that actually are bringing forth like the real, the real, um, you know, the real, the real treasure. Uh, <laughs> because, yeah, well, I can go on and on, uh, mm-hmm. and I do. But uh, I have... don't we all? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's good. Uh, but I, I also do need lunch. And... Yeah, I guess you do. And I need supper. <laughs> yeah. Five o'clock here. Good time over here. (laughs) All right. Well, then, any last words before I click the button? No, Um, I enjoyed our talk this evening. I did too. Oh, next week, if we're doing the Tuesday Cafe, can we do a follow up to what Ed presented? Because I didn't feel like we finished with that. Is that okay? It's fine with me. Because I have some questions. Okay. About that. We can start with your questions. Yeah, we'll, 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 do, we'll, we'll do it online and we'll maybe. Okay. okay. Is that okay with you, Marco and Doug? If we yeah. Can with the, I've actually yeah. had an idea. Unless you had a plan, unless you had something else. <laughs> no, I had an idea with respect to Ed's oh, uh, okay. presentation. Uh, okay, why don't, why don't we just throw that all in the pot and then let's we'll see what we, we can Put it all in the Play-Doh thing and let's see if we can form something out of it. Okay. 
Yeah. I'm just going to throw it out right now quickly. So okay. I don't forget it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I am curious how many dimensions of order there are in, in this text and okay. how we might de delineate them. And so if for the sound is one dimension, if the uh, graphene is another dimension, okay. if the, and then there's the meta dimension. Uh, and I wonder how we could write poetry <laughs> that is like multidimensional that way, some wow. sort of seven dimensional poetry or, or what, what, whatever it might be. That would be very cool to encode at each of those levels. Maybe. That's what I think like the brilliance of what, what you presented as it got kind of my, my gears turning mm -hmm. uh, was what, what genius would it take to write that? Okay. Sounds like it needs a video response. <laughs> At least incorporated <laughs> into it, honestly. Yeah, do that. Do, do that. Doc, do that. Yeah. Wait, me? No. <laughs> did you you did you post an article of yours, Ed? Was there a, an essay in there that you had? Yeah, there was there was a short article in there. I wanna I'm gonna look at that. I haven't had a chance yeah, to look yeah. At that. yeah, there was a there were a couple of references afterwards, yeah. So I'll do my homework and I'll have some questions. I'm sure you will. Yeah. I would be surprised if you didn't. <laughs> I got this. I'm, I owed the Stan Tennant book. I watched yeah, you said that you did. I mean, you're a brave man, John. <laughs> <laughs> it, takes, it takes one to know why. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not an easy, it's not an easy read, but I was leaping through uh, uh, Lynn Claire uh, Dennis's uh, book. Uh -huh. How is it? Is it hard? Well, it, it made me. It made it made me want to go read ten and again. <laughs> oh, well. I, I ordered that book too because I'm interested yeah. in Luke Kaufman. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's a he's an interesting fellow. I I bet he's a real trip when you sit down and talk with him. Yeah. yeah. This is another direction. Uh, I have a friend who uh, Lisa Morawski. She wrote a book um, on a very really interesting uh, n novel, and uh, she writes on. Um, topo dimensionality. She uses these um, topo dimensions in her fiction. So I think we would ha could have her on as a guest. Uh, she and I are talking about doing a presentation together at the next Gebser Society. That's where I met her. I met her at the Gebser Society recently. And um, so she's put me in touch with Grand Priest and these guys that I find very fascinating. So anyway, that's a project that's in the hopefully the near near future. Okay. Okay. And we the, got it on tape now, John, so you Doug, can't... Doug, oh, you no, I never saw that. Yeah. <laughs> you also have a post, Doug, on um, human... I, I, I can't even remember what it was called at this point. <laughs> uh, but no, that that was almost an idea I'd like fleshed out. So this would have been mm -hmm. the video portion of it. Us talking about it would be the fleshing out. But there was quite a bit of discussion um, that's already happened. That's kind of mm -hmm. made me rethink the whole process. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll put it on the back burner. It sounds like uh, going with Ed next Ed's second presentation or whoever presents Ed's material. Uh, and I'll, I'll probably be in the batting box as other people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not unrelated. I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't no, no, they're not uh, unrelated, and that's why it would probably uh, be a good idea if you started thinking very seriously about it, uh, Doug, to. Uh, maybe follow up even the week after, you know, there's no, there's no reason why we can't schedule these things. Yeah. But, and going along with what John said, if inviting a guest, that would yeah. mean a specific date needs to be planned. So right. we're, I'm leaving this open as kind of a, mm -hmm. a filler or a, we have a gap in the schedule. So, Hey, let's oh. use Doug's idea right. type of thing. So that's, that's cool too. Yeah. None of the stuff goes away, you know, are are you yeah. able to participate, Jeffrey, in any of this, or do you even have interest? <laughs> like, well, oh no, these guys. Well, Tuesdays are a work day for me. That's part of the reason why I was late. Um, so I'll try and come when I can, but it's not always possible. I'm curious, Jeffrey, about your ten year program, uh, your multiple ten year programs. You've met, you've dropped 20, a little bit about twenty. 20, 20, yeah, 20. Year programs. yeah, let's not let's not cut them short. <laughs> <laughs> this is a man with multiple visions. <laughs> I think Just that's to throw an idea. I mean, I I would uh, love to take uh, 
you know, an hour or two for you to yeah to, to present on those if you mm-hmm. would to, well, well like I, I said in the blog or in the in the exchange you throw these things out and you do work your life around them mm. but fortunately other people are doing their stuff as well because if it was just you you'd never make it <laughs> 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 The world moves along with you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you still do interesting things. Mm. <laughs> I'd be happy to talk about it if uh, yeah, yeah. it felt useful. Great. That'd be good. Okay. Seeds planted. Mm-hmm. Uh well, then uh let's let's reconvene next week and in the meantime we'll be uh see you on the forum. Okay. Thank you. All, All right. right. Sounds good. Thanks, good everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good week.